गणपति हवामहे कवि कवीनामुपम्रवस्तम ज्येष्ठराज ब्रह्मण ब्रह्मणस्पत आन शृण्वन्नूतिदीद साधन प्रणोदेवी सरस्वती वाजेभिर्वाजिनी वती धीनाम विक्रियवतु गणेशाय नम सरस्वत्य नम श्री गुरुभ्यो नम हरि ओ लविंग लविंग साई राम The Sri Satya Sai Global Council Zone One lovingly welcomes you to a panel discussion entitled Vedic Prayers and Yagnas. The intention of which is to inform, educate, inspire, and generate interest for the upcoming Vedic Yagya in Trinidad in November 2022, led by Sri Ved Narayan. We have with us a distinguished panel comprising of our Zone One Chairman, Dr. Akshay Kalatiya, Brother Vijay Sagram Singh, Spiritual Advisor to Zone One, and Brother Arun Utayan, a Sai alumnus who was a member of the Veda Chanting Group in Prashanti Nilayam and a member of the Sri Satya Sai Institute of Higher Learning. All of these distinguished devotees have held many distinguished positions in the Sai organization over the years and have served Swami committedly and dedicatedly. So we lovingly welcome you to this panel discussion. And our very first question, can you share how you first learned about the Vedas and Yagnas and why you became interested in them. I don't know if we can begin with Brother Arun on this question. Okay, Sairam, brother. Um, the, your question triggers a memory back, you know, in 1971. I was uh, hardly seven years old. We happened to go to Prashant in 1971 during Dashara. That was our second trip to Prashant in I had never heard of Vedas or Yagnas before that. But it so happened we stayed there for about 21 days and we were first exposed to a Yagna in Prashant in with Swami performing, uh, you know, an integral part of uh, that Yagna. Uh, that's what I remember as... When you say Vedas or Yajna, I remember those days. And thereafter, uh, you know, whenever I read, uh, you know, uh, stories from Ramayana or Mahabharata, and, you know, you hear of uh, Sri Rama going to, you know, protect the Yajna and so on. So, you know, it always reminded me, you know, Swami has come again. The same one who protected the Yajna of Vishwamitra, Sage Vishwamitra, is here. And, um, you know, that's what sparked my interest in the Vedas, as well as uh, Yajnas, Saira. Thank you very much. Very inspiring and informative sharing. Brother Akshay, would you like to share your perspective? Yes, Saira, thank you. Um, I remember many years ago, hearing young students, probably primary school age, standing at the podium. Uh, I may have been watching a video in Prashanti and they were chanting and I was very much drawn to it. I didn't know what it was they were chanting, but I remember back then having a fleeting thought that you know one day it would be nice if I could learn that. And then subsequently I learned it was the Ganapati Pratana, but at that time I had no idea what they were chanting. 
So fast forward many years after that, around the early 2000s, and we were very fortunate to have a Psy student become a member of our center. And he introduced many of us to some very simple chants, including Ganapati Pratana, Sarva Devata Gayatri, Mantra Pushpam. And I became very much drawn to it. Uh, I really didn't understand it. I, I didn't know the meanings, but I was drawn by it. And uh, by 2003, uh, Veda chanting was started in Sai Kulwant Hall uh, during Darshan time when Swami would come out. And I remember being there and uh, buying cassettes in the Prashanti bookstore. Uh, they had this one uh, small book that came with a, a cassette. And uh, I bought it, took it home with me. And every day I would put the cassette in the car and and uh, listen. Uh, and while I was listening, I would uh, repeat it, pause, repeat it, play, rewind, pause. So I really learned to chant driving. Uh, so I don't know how proper that is, but that, that's the way uh, Swami introduced me to the Vedas. And then by 2006, I had finished learning Rudra. And a very special moment occurred. I had just finished learning Rudram, and I visited Prashanti. And the very first darshan, they, when Swami came out, they started with Rudram. Rudram was being chanted. And so I remember just the, 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 the amazing feeling I had that I was able to chant the Rudram in front of the Rudra. And Swami was there, and I was getting darshan, and I was chanting the Rudram in His presence. And, and it was such a wonderful, uh, wonderful memory. So, Sidon. Brother, actually, what a, what a wonderful experience. And then to be doing it in the immediate physical presence of the Veda Purusha himself. What a blessing. Brother Vijay? Well, guys, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. When I hear these brothers speak of, of how, you know, <laughs> Their good merits, you know, drew them to Bhagwan in the form of Vedas. I unfortunately have not yet been able to to acquire that merit to to learn Veda. Uh, but Yajna, uh, from a very well, my great grandparents, great great grandparents, they came from India and they were Purohits. You know, they performed Purohits karma. So they were very versed in in slokas and Vedic chants and stuff like that. Of course. I was too young at the time to, to kind of understand what they were doing, but I loved it all the same. And then growing up as a child, you know, I did sort of uh, attended Guru Kul, so to speak. My guru was or is a popular priest in, in Trinidad and Tobago. And um, because of his grace and association with him, I was able to attend hundreds of yags, <laughs> not just one. I mean, we, we, we did probably about 30 something yags a year. And that happened for almost almost two decades. So I consider that, that a great blessing, you know, in the sense of just being in that in environment, listening to slokas being chanted. And uh, of course, I don't know Sanskrit. So I, I, but, but what was amazing is that I loved it immensely. And of course, we know that um, the most sacred uh, scripture uh, of Sanatana Dharma is, of course, the Vedas, because it is, the scripture which, you know, takes us to or show us who God is and in ourselves. So intrigued by all of this, you know, association, so to speak, I decided that, look, I want to learn something. And thankfully, I started, you know, learning Hindi a little bit with my mom's guidance. I was able to read Ramayana. And, and so I've been able to read Ramayana Katha for, for a few decades now and enjoy that part of it. So the Yajna is something that was very special to me. And I have dabbled a little bit with Vedam. Uh, in my family, my son and my wife, they can recite the Rudram, unfortunately. I think it's laziness is probably what has prevented me from, from genuinely making the right effort. But hopefully with all of these wonderful things that are happening, I think my time is at hand or is nearby <laughs> to learn it. So I don't know. Thank you very much, Brother Vijay. And yes, I was witness to a few of your beautiful Ramayan Yagyas and expounding of the scriptures. And they were really, really inspiring and beautiful. And as you said, you've had a very long history growing up in Trinidad and Tobago under the, the different pundits. So, Brother Arun, can you explain what exactly 
is a yagna and why are they performed? Sorry, brother, what, you know, whatever limited understanding I have gained from what listening to Swami, so I will share what I can. Uh, the yagna by simply it means giving, offering something, offering something to the Lord. And uh, in the Hindu tradition, um, the belief is Sanatana Dharma believes that all of us have different debts in this world. Um, so we have five kinds of debts for which we have to do five type of yajna. We have to offer something. We have to sacrifice something. Um, but what we are talking about here is the Brahma yajna, uh, where you know, which is our our uh, debt to God and the rishis, and uh, how do we pay pay off our debt? Because because of the rishis and God's grace that we are all alive, so our life has to uh, be a sacrifice by itself. The entire life has to be sacrificed to get to that point where everything in our life is a sacrifice. We offer everything back to God. Whatever we have has to be offered back to God for the welfare of the world. So that is the basis on which Yajna was uh, taught by the Vedas. So the Brahmanas, you know, the texts called Brahmanas in the Vedas prescribe what type of Yajnas have to be performed for what purpose and so on. And so ultimately, Swami says yajna is a fire ritual where we offer ghee. So I think I, that's something which appealed to me, so I thought I would share. Swami says ghee is offered to the fire law, God. What is this ghee? It comes from a cow. Cow is the most sacred animal, which gives us milk, which all provides all nourishment for everyone. And... How is this ghee obtained? By taking the milk, you curdle it, you, you know, extract the butter, then you clarify it, and then you take that and offer it to the Lord. So that is the symbolism at the physical level. But Swami says, the Gu also stands for Vedas. So just the way ghee is extracted from the cow milk, we have to extract the essence of the Vedas, and that has to be offered, which is Vedic chants are chanted while we offer it. Then Swami says, go also means our heart. So heart means we have to draw out that love, which is like the ghee, which comes from the cow. So we have to take that also and offer it to the Lord. And through this process, which physical ritual, which rishis, who are great scientists, who are spiritual scientists, have given us as formulas to practice, um, it, they have multiple dimensions of benefits at the physical level to the world, the material level, at the mental level, and at the spiritual level. And because of this uh, effort, when we do it with devotion, the entire world benefits, not only us. Um, so this is what I understand. Swami says, by practicing this on a regular basis, we will learn how to dedicate every single activity as a yajna to God, as an offering to the Lord. Uh, through that process, our entire life will become sanctified. So this is what, in in short, what I have understood from Swami as to, to discourse and writings. And so I thought I would share that. I hope uh, I answered your question reasonably okay to my understanding. Very much so, Brother Arun. Brother Akshay, Brother Vijay, would you like to add to what Brother Arun has just shared? Yes. So nice, nicely explained this, uh, and particularly you know with the authority of the of the master himself. What Bhagwan says is, is, of course, you know we we can't challenge anything at all. Um, and and brother, as you were explaining this, it just it, it reminds me of of the gratitude we owe to every aspect of divinity, you know, in nature and whatever, you know, that we we're getting an opportunity because even our own body is made up of of of, of the elements and what have you. And, uh, and the, the source from which they have come, I mean, we are expressing our gratitude in the form of yajna. Like, you know, Swami says you perform yajna, rain comes, and from rain we get grains and crops, and, and all of this, you know, makes up this body, which of course we can, you know, definitely state why we are divine. Because everything that, that is this body comes from, uh, as a sacrifice from yajna. Uh, that is my opinion. <laughs> 
Thanks. Thank you. Brother Akshay. Yeah, it was uh, just wonderful to hear that. Um, having something that growing up in the West, not really having much exposure to the Vedas, it can be very bewildering and, and um, hard to relate to. And so I think, um, you know, when we understand it through the basics, uh, like Brother Arun explained, is it's all about gratitude. It's all about appreciation. It's all about what can we do to give back and show our gratitude? And most of us, you know, we, we, we tend to be preoccupied with ourselves. We're so egocentric. And, and whether we identify with ourselves only or our, or our immediate families or our, our immediate community, I think the yajnas force us to give up ourselves, to give, give up these attachments uh, to something far greater than ourselves, even though we may not be able to understand it, just knowing that there's something greater than ourselves and making the effort, like Brother Arun said, with our hearts, to open our hearts up and give ourselves up. That space we create, Swami then takes over and, and will we'll guide us further along in our, in our path on learning the Vedas. Thank you very much, Brother Akshay. And as Brother Arun was, was sharing, you know, especially along the line of the offering, it reminded me of a, a discourse that Swami gave in October 1977 from Mahashivaratri, where he talked about the inner significance of the outward ritual. And it was so beautifully explained by Brother Arun, where Swami said that when you offer the leaf, the leaf is like your body, which has to be used in selfless service to humanity. He said, the fruit is the mind which has, has to be surrendered at the feet of the Lord. The flower is the heart filled with your bhakti and your devotion. And the water is the tears that flow from the eyes of the devotee when he's in ecstatic communion with the divine. So we begin with the yajna and the physical offering, but I like how you intertwined it, that at the end of it, we must be able to see Krishna, see Rama, experience God everywhere. So very beautifully explained. Thank you so much, brother. Brother Akshay, what relevance do these rituals have in modern day life? So, you know, I think once we understand that the Vedas, these Vedic mantras are, are of divine origin, so that means they they contain contain the secrets of, of the universe. Uh, they're they're invested and they're imbibed with all the powers of creation. So it's a it's a bridge for us into a different dimension, a divine dimension, beyond time, beyond space. And so it can be, you know, like Brother Aruno said, transformational at so many levels: physical, emotional, mental, vibrational levels we're not even aware of that we're not even cognizant of. And, and they'll penetrate our very beings. It'll penetrate us. It'll penetrate our, our environment. And it'll propel us and our environment into that divine oneness, the realization that we are all one. And I think that's a fundamental message that the Vedas have come to give us. Says everything that, that's explained in the Vedas ultimately leads us to that realization of that divine oneness. And then uh, I remember Swami saying, uh, 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 reading somewhere that uh, it's, it's an, uh, analogous to the uh, a mother singing a lullaby to their child, right? The child is benefiting from that lullaby. Uh, it's being soothed. It's being reassured. It beautifully smiles and falls asleep without having any idea of the meaning of our understanding anything about it. So how powerful the lullaby is for the child. The same thing with us with the Vedas. It's so powerful for us. Uh, without our mental capacities ever, ever being able to grasp it. Uh, it goes beyond our intellect, beyond our powers of comprehension. So we, with our limited mind, if we think we're going to understand the totality of it, we're, on, we're going down the wrong path. We have to experience it and benefit from it, just like the baby experiences and benefits from the mother's lullaby. And then one other reason, a simple reason as a side devotee, wh why is it relevant? Well, it's relevant because... Swami gave so much importance to the Vedas. In fact, that was part of his mission. He said his mission was fourfold. One of that was to restore the Vedas. The other one was to those that propagate the Vedas. So, so that in and of itself, 
should show us how greatly relevant the Vedas are in today's society. Sign on. Thank you so much, Brother Akshay. Brother Vijay? Yeah, uh, and Akshay is correct. Um, uh, the Vedas do form the fundamental understanding of Sanatana Dharma. You know, without which we, could, we couldn't understand God. God, Brahman, the Supreme Brahman, cannot be understood. But out of this Brahman, out of the love and compassion of this consciousness came the Vedas and, and the great deities who, you know, expounded. So, again, as Akshay said, um, some of us may never even, you know, be blessed to, to comprehend the, the Vedas. But the fact that you can, uh, you know, be taught how to respect it, how to, to, to listen to it, how to, uh, you know, behave and, and accept the fact that it can change you without even you knowing or, or just being in the orbit where it is chanted. I mean, how many times in Prashanti Nilayam, you know, Vedas has been recited, especially when I was, I, I would just close my eyes and sit. I don't have a clue, but I know I can feel some energy. I can feel some, some wonderful things that are happening. You know, I'm becoming peaceful and calm. And Prashanti can be very chaotic, you know, sometimes with, with all the hustle and bustle and all the, the different minds of, of people coming there for whatever reason. But you listen, you know, to, to the Vedam being chanted and you can definitely come out with something, you know, beautiful. You, you feel this calm, this peace, and you cannot explain it. Sairam. Thank you very much, Brother Vijay. Brother Arun, would you like to add a contribution? Um, I don't have much to add, but, you know, you said what is its relevance for modern day world? So, you know, to some extent, we think Veda is ancient. Yes, it is ancient, but Swami will say it's eternal. It's yeah. not, it's, it's only for the past. Um, it's like, you know, how relevant is sun in modern day world? <laughs> uh, you know, sun has been relevant and it will be relevant as long as human beings live. So Vedas, Swami says, eternal truth. Just like the value of truth, value of love. Are they relevant for modern day? They are as relevant. So Vedas is a quintessential form of uh, all values which are embedded. So they are eternally, so they, there's the concept of modern, uh, it's, it's all fashion fad based, but yes. eternal truths, they are uh, applicable to all times. So yes, I thought right. I just mentioned that side. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. That is absolutely beautiful. There's nothing more I think we can add to that contribution. Yeah, absolutely. So Brother Vijay, can, can you talk a little bit about Sri Vednarayan and the good fortune we have that he's coming from Prashanti to lead in the conducting of this wonderful yagna? So, uh, of course, I am so unqualified to even to speak about Vednarayan, but, um, but I'll do my best. And, and I'm, I'm hoping that Arun, Aruno will give us some, you know, some his perspective as well and, and Brother Akshay. So I've known Brother Vednarayan for about two, and, two decades plus. And um, I'm had the, I know he comes from a very pious uh, Brahmin family. Um, I know his brother, Mohan, as well. And, um, and to tell you the truth, I know Vedran, and Arun will be able to tell you more of this, came to Swami's fold as a very young man. And, um, and I'll tell you a, a small story. You know, I, in the early 90s, when I used to go Prashanti, I would see this young gentleman who was very, uh, you know, he, wasn't, he didn't have the size that he has now. All right, very tall, and he would be always riding a bike with a carrier. And I would notice him, you know, going into um, Purna Chandra Hall with his carrier and coming out of it. And I'm saying, wow, what a good, blessed kid, you know. Um, needless to say, I met Vidna and we became, you know, we know we know each knew each other because of uh, some you know, ceremonies which he has performed. And not only that, I've been able to, to travel with Ryan, you know, to different countries, you know, with him doing Vedic ceremonies, you know, giving philosophical talks, giving his Shane, his experiences with, of Bhagwan. So I've spent quite a lot of time, you know, in his presence. And I must say that, you know, he's always been the same. He's humble, he's loving, he has the patience to listen to people, to give, uh, you know, any advice that is asked of him. 
Um, I remember once uh, we went to Alaska on a small vacation. And you know, in summer in Alaska, of course, the sun sets like about 12.30 p.m. You know, at night, sorry, a.m. Uh, or 12 o'clock at night. And it, this, the sunrise will start at 4 a.m. And lo and behold, Queen Ryan will go to bed at 12 and he's up at 4 doing his pujas. And, um, and of course, you know, I, I'm certain that all Brahmin children who are brought up properly will do the same. And I would say, I mean, you can't just leave one day off at least. He said, no, 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 I, I cannot. I started this. I'm already in the loop. I have to continue this for the rest of my life. So I said, Brahmin, you're so blessed to be, you know, to, to Swami to have given you this opportunity to recite Vedam continuously. And lo and behold, he said to me, Vijay, that is absurd. He said, Swami could create a hundred Vednarayan with, with just a blink of his eye. He said, so this is nothing. This is my grace. This is my blessing. This is, Swami can do that easily. And I saw the humility, you know, that look, he's, he's definitely centered, you know, properly. His, his, his foot, if you would say, is well planted, understanding him uh, uh, himself as a student in the presence of Bhagwan, and knowing that look everything that he has has today and probably in the future that he will attain or, or, or people that he'll meet or places he'll go it's only because of Bhagwan's grace so I can't say much where the wisdom and the knowledge and how great he can expound Ved uh, Vedam because I'm not qualified to even speak of that but what I can say is that the the people of Trinidad Tobago and all of us who, who will be attending this yajna, we are very, very blessed and fortunate to, to have a personality, a person of his caliber. Vidna is a brahmachari. He has uh, lived this life and uh, I'm sure I will leave the rest for Aruno to, to, to continue. Sairam. Sairam, uh, I guess it has just fallen. I think Vijay took my name too many times. So I will <laughs> So I've known Vedanarayan for over four decades now. <laughs> Hello, student. Uh, he joined a few years before I joined. Uh, but when I joined uh, in Parthi, he was in Brindavan. He was studying in Brindavan. Um, so as you know, I, so in Parthi, I became part of the Veda group uh, because because the only reason was you know I didn't get to I didn't get selected as a singer in the Monday. <laughs> so I thought. I will join the Vedam group because there were only five, six of us. The first year Swami started the college. So I got a lot of chances uh, chanting Vedas, and which I did for about five years. Then later I got some opportunity in the music group. Then after that, I sort of, you know, didn't pay as much attention. But um, I think Swami, you know, sometimes we, we are looking for something, but Swami has other plans. So the first five years uh, of my seven years stay, I, I was a Vedam boy. Um, so at that time, we used to look up to people like uh, Vedanara and, and Shiva Sankarsa, you know, they all, yeah. some of the original Vedam boys from Vrindavan, they used to come sometimes uh, to Parthi and, you know, we all used to chant together and they will coach us and train us on some other chanting. But now after 40 years, I look back and look at, him, you know, the, the opportunity to chant the Vedas in the presence of Swami. Uh, you know, whether it is whether he deserved or Swami gave, he's just that, you know, a person will be just charged. Every day you are chanting the Vedas in the presence of the divine, in Prashantanalayam, and he has not left the place for, I don't know, more than 45 years now. Uh, every day he has chanted. So that will do something to the person and, you know, the energy which Swami has stored and poured, I would say. And to be there, knowing the importance of it, day in and day out, chanting three times a day minimum, uh, is a blessing. Uh, you know, whether, uh, you know, not everyone has the opportunity. I would, I, you know, it's, it so happened that uh, I, I had given up chanting. You know, I, whenever I, you know, periodically, whenever somebody is chanting somewhere, I would go and chant. But I never chanted at home. And I read a discourse of Swami in 2007. Swami says, I have spent a lot of effort in teaching some of these students Vedas and these guys are not chanting. It's like stealing. You know, you oh, want yeah. to uh, you know, benefit from others chanting. You also have to contribute. Whoever has learned should be learned. So, you know, then I said, you know, I am such a fool compared to, you know, 
if only i knew the value and i chanted maybe i would have had an opportunity to chant you know more often so i think that blessing of swami giving them and i would also like to say you know there are many people who he is um, the vedanarayana has chanted he will say there are other vedic scholars who chant much more uh, accurately the, the best pronunciation enunciation and so on they may understand the meaning better but i think sometimes swami gives a lot of importance to the bhava mm-hmm. see to chant with that devotion not that you know i am chanting so perfectly my pronunciation is the best i understand the meaning but when you chant in front of swami that bhava is so 100% which blessing uh, you know when not very not many people receive so i think that has been a great fortune for him and the swami chooses different instruments for different purposes and i think that's one purpose whether we like it or not before he was born swami had planned what he will be doing <laughs> that his name itself is vedanara yes brother akshay would you like to share a little uh, i can just remember uh, memories fond memories of uh, brother vedanara coming to our center some 15 20 years ago uh enlightening all of us educating us and then periodically seeing him whenever i visited prashanti and he would always humbly take time explain things answer questions um and just just uh, very fortunate to have come across uh such an individual i'm just very very honored to have been able to meet him thank you very much for sharing and while you all were sharing you know brother vijay would would surely remember this i remember through swami's grace and blessings attending the sahasra purna darshana mahotsavam where swami had invited uh, the saints and sages from all over india to conduct uh, this three day yajna to bring about world peace and i remember the last day it culminated in the um that big stadium the hillview stadium and swami came on the the golden chariot and it was a most indescribable blissful experience and i remember taking up the phone brother akshay and called my wife and i told her i'm not coming home because of the bliss and the happiness that 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 i was feeling and then i i thought to myself um that why can we not have some like this in trinidad trinidad you know we were plagued with crime and violence and robberies and there was so much of unrest and i remember going to ask shri vidnarayan if it is possible we could have such or similar offering and he said brother i must get the permission of swami and after a couple of days he got the permission and brother vijay you know he came to trinidad and did a most wonderful tremendously powerful and spiritually elevating uh, yagya with us involving the whole sai community and what a tremendous blessing it was at that time so i think we really 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 blessed and fortunate to have him once again with us so this is a question to the entire panel so anybody can jump in first should the sai organization be putting on such programs what about in the western world where sanskrit is not known and they have other languages and traditions that have been historically followed sir so, uh, maybe maybe i can jump in and uh, curious to see what uh, my brother's suggestions are as well so I, i think you know swami started this organization to to facilitate the transformation of humanity of each and every one of us and and to foster anyone who sincerely wanted to progress spiritually and so the role of that of our organization of swami's organization is to put on a variety of spiritually elevating programs and that means to cater to a variety of people um and then people have the choice to participate in those programs that they find most inspiring so i think as an organization we should be fostering all paths as many cultures and creeds as possible and of course veda chanting as we talked about earlier it's so powerful it's so transformative uh and the the core messages of the vedas of love and unity and sacrifice uh, are, are you know what swami always emphasizes 
So, you know, and Swami himself has, has mentioned the power and applicability of the Vedas. Uh, that's what's so desperately needed in today's world. So, of course, you know, no path is, is mandatory. No activity is mandatory. One should always follow their heart and do what, what they're drawn to. But as an organization, uh, Veda chanting should be one component, one powerful component to make avail to those that sincerely want to progress spiritually. You know, just like seva, just like uh, bhajan learning, just like study circles. This is another path that's made available. It's a very, very powerful path for those that are drawn to it. Sorry. Thank you very much for sharing, uh, Brother Akshay. I want to leave Brother Arun for last. Brother Vijay, your your contribution. Yeah, I, I think Brother Akshay said it nicely. Um, the thing to just to add to that, of course, if we, we are going to uh, you know have Vedam chanting, we must have the, the, the correct people who should teach it and, and, and would be able to guide us. And to provide Westerners with, with, you know, the comfort of good explanation, why you do what, how you do it, and when to do it, all this kind of thing. Um, I remember, you know, in the organization before, um, we had this debate at a council meeting in California and um, as to whether we should do Vedam chanting or not. And it was a hot topic, you know, maybe a decade and a half ago. And some some folks were saying yes, some were saying no. I think uh, one of the elders went to Bhagwan and asked, uh, and uh, and <laughs> the question was asked like this: Swami, should we do Vedas in America? That's after, right? Swami had made a pronouncement on on Vedam chanting. So the question was asked to Swami, and I was physically there. One of the elders asked in, in the council, Swami, should we do Vedam chant in America? And Swami said no. So when Swami said no. I just looked at the brothers on the side and said, it's the wrong question. The question should have been, Swami, can you offer some guidance how we should do Vedam in, in the United States? And whilst we were talking, one of the other brothers who was doing, running the, 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 the audio video thing, he put up you know, a, a video and took off and showed Swami and he took off the volume where Swami was given the discourse translated by Professor Anand Kumar where Swami said, Vedam Shantin should be all, done all in all countries all over the world. Right simultaneously when this debate was going on. So it, I, I have to say this, that you know I don't know why uh, this question was put to Bhagwan when after Bhagwan, before, sorry, Bhagwan said, yes, Vedam Shantin should be done all over the world. So We've we've had some situations where you know we've had to to dabble with figuring what to do with Vedam chanting, but I think it's very clear to us now, as Akshay mentioned, why we should do it, the reason behind it, and and the efficacy of Vedam chanting in all our lives. Sairam. Okay, Sairam, brother. Um, uh, you know, I think, but there's a misunderstanding in the feeling that. Every Indian knows Sanskrit. <laughs> okay, that's a, in India, there are about 40 odd languages, hundreds of dialects. If you take Rudram, 99% of the words which occur in Rudram will be completely Greek or Latin to any <laughs> most Indians. 99% yes. of the Indians will find it Greek. They will not understand a single word. They will even find it difficult to pronounce because it's foreign. This is the reality. So many people think Sanskrit is a very common language which every Indian understands. No. The reality may be that many of the languages have lots of Sanskrit words. Just the way even foreign languages have Sanskrit words, as Swami has pointed out. Mm -hmm. Maybe the number wouldn't be less. So Sanskrit is not an Indian language. It is a language. And you know, when we are born in a family, you know, we, we adopt a language which is spoken at home. So I think that's the first point. Um, then, you know, what is its relevance to a Parthi uh, in our organization? If you go back to the first World Conference in uh, 1968 May, in 16th uh, May 1968 was the first World Conference and Swami um, started the talk. And Swami started the talk in Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. Swami spoke for the first five minutes in Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. And he says, such a momentous occasion like this demands that I speak in Sanskrit. Oh. So he spoke for five minutes in Sanskrit. And in the first discourse, first day discourse, inaugural discourse, 
as well as the third day discourse, 19, 18th May, 1968. Wow. Swami say, goes on to say, every center in every center of the Sri Satya Sai organization. So this is a world conference, okay? There are members from every country. That's first time members from all the countries at assemble. And Swami says, it is one of the primary things every Sai center should do so that people, young and old, children and old, will learn Sanskrit. We can go and read, you know, when Swami says, so that's the first time Openly, Swami said to die, that everyone should learn. So I think, I think that to going back to Brother Vijay's, uh, Vijay's, you know, narration of Swami saying no, because he asked, should we chant? Swami said no. The thing is, the answer is Swami said, don't chant. He didn't say. It is not a should. It's an option to whoever is interested. As an org, as an organization, we have to provide the opportunity if people want to pursue that. Mm -hmm. Because I am, re I am rem reminded of her, uh, another time, you know, in 2001, when all the Sri Satya Sai school uh, teachers had a conference in Prashantanilayam, and Swami had a question and answer session. Uh, we can find it in the Satya Sai speaks, in which one someone asked a question to Swami. Swami, should we teach Gayatri in our schools? Again, same question, brother. You, okay, Swami goes on to say, I am not telling that you should chant Gayatri. I am not telling that you should not chant Gayatri. Mine is not to lay down a loan of should and should not. It should all come from your heart. Yes. Mm -hmm. I have already explained the benefits of chanting Gayatri mm -hmm. and what it does to a child. It is for you all to do what is feel, mm -hmm. what you feel right in your heart. So Swami has never said something should be done or something should not be done in these kinds of spiritual practices. But Swami he keeps it open for everyone. And Swami also has encouraged people because there are benefits. So I think as an organization, we should not make it a taboo. Not We should not impose everyone to learn. But it should be an option of sadhana, which is available for devotees who wish to make use of it. Because as Brother Akshay said, this is also part of knowledge uh, which people, which will help people go towards the Lord and achieve the goal of our life. Saira, I hope uh, yes. I didn't take too much time. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Brother Arun. The next question is for all as well. Can you share what you have learned about the symbolism embedded in these yajnas? I can I can start again. I'll, I'll jump in. So you know, at, at, when I first learned, of course, I didn't know anything about the meaning. And then when I tried to study and learn the meaning, it was not very relatable you know, ferocious God and, and you know, appeasing God. And, and it just, it, to me, I couldn't bridge the meaning I was reading with Swami's teachings, which were so dear to me, which, what, which was what brought me to Swami. It was his teachings that introduced me to Swami. So, so I, I, I thought, how could this be relevant today? And it's only because of my faith in Baba and, and his mercy and his grace that I had the patience to continue with my study and then when the time was right, the proper meanings and symbolism came from various sources. So, you know, I think it is important to understand the meaning. But that meaning has to be understood with the background of the overall theme. And that's why I think we as Swami devotees are so lucky. Because the essence of the Vedas, Swami has already taught us. He's already taught us that. So everything we learn in the Vedas, we can use... Swami's teachings as a touchstone for what's in the Vedas. Other people that are, that are not devotees of Swami have to do the opposite. They have to interpret the Vedas and try to apply it. And sometimes that interpretation in this Kali Yuga, uh, with the lack of intellect that we all have compared to the sages' intellect, 
we may have mistaken one meaning for another. And that's the, the, the you know, a big problem in our society and in the world today. So we have Swami's teachings to be the bedrock to then uh, make sure that anything we interpret in the Vedas has to be in consonance with Swami's teachings. And, and so we know how simple Swami's teachings are. Love all, serve all. Be good, do good, see good. Have gratitude to your parents. Uh, you know, sacrifice is the only way to immortality. You know, all of these things are embedded in the Vedas. And, and of course, Swami and the Vedas are synonymous. The source of the Vedas is Swami. The Vedas are Swami. So, so there, and there's, multi, as Brother Aruno mentioned, there's multiple, multiple layers. Uh, you know, there's layers that, that uh, we can uh, relate to with our body. There's layers we can relate to that affect our mind. And then there's deeper spiritual layers. Same thing with the, the symbolism. There's, there's the extant meaning that may sound ridiculous to us. But if we leave it at that, we're, we miss out. Then there's a layer of meaning that's even deeper. And then there's a layer of meaning that's even deeper. And it can go on multiple, multiple layers. And so I think you have to have humility, uh, which goes with what Brother Uno said. The bhava has got to be the most important thing. And anything we do in Swami's organization, whether with seva, bhajans, uh, anything, bhava is the most important thing. And same thing goes with the Vedas, because once you have the bhava, you have the grace of God who will then give you everything else that you need to, to get the proper understanding. Sairam. Brother Vijay. So, so the confusion, my confusion was much more greater than anybody else's confusion here in this, on this panel. And, and the reason being, I was born in an Orthodox Hindu home. And as a very young child, you know, I lived in a place, of, of course, it's Trinidad, so we have a cosmopolitan country. But, you know, I was intrigued by, by Jesus and his life. And so I wanted to know something about Jesus. So I, I approached my dad and I said, you know, you have any objection if I would have, you know, join, go to church? Yeah, he said, fine, go to church, but don't forget your roots. Don't forget where you come back from. And of course, I stepped into the Catholic church. I, I became, you know, uh, baptized, made first communion, confirmation, the whole, you know, all these sanskaras, you could say. And then, um, and, and then I had the conflict now of, understanding the teachings of Jesus and trying to relate to, to our in the scriptures and its symbolism and the different gods and, and, and it was a conflict. But actually I said it correctly. The intentions were really pure. I look at Jesus as a sage and I said, you know, this is a sage, you know, an accomplished sage. And then my, after, after having delved into, you know, into Christianity and, and trying to work my way back to Hinduism or Sanatana Dharma, and then there's nobody around to really allow the guidance. Then, then came the Ramayana in the little village in the community, and I loved it. I just loved it in spite of, of all the, 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 the strange, you know, beings that I would come across with Kabanda, and, and you know these, these different uh, folks which was confusing to me, but for, for the life of me, I don't know why I loved it. And so a transition, it, there, there came a point where I had to say, look, Sanatana Dharma is, is too big, too, it's too wide. I need to, to, to dedicate more time towards that. And so I, there was a transition. I made the shift. I decided now I want to learn something about Sanatana Dharma. And of course, what I picked up was Adi Shankara, which made it even more confusing because he's saying there's only Atma, there's nothing else but God and consciousness. And, and now I had to dabble with this sort of thing, you know, getting away from the rituals and, and more dealing with the self and who am I and all this kind of stuff. But, um, but at the end of it all, Swami came finally. And he's, I, I started to get involved in, with his writing, his literature, his discourses, which kind of sort of cleared the air for me to understand that, look, you know, I cannot understand that this convoluted dharma, sanatana dharma, can be put so simply. So you could understand that the layman can pick up a book, read a discourse, and, and Swami is not getting into any difficult, you know, language that is beyond you understand. He has spoon fed us over the years to understand and appreciate this eternal Sanatana Dharma. So, you know, I don't know if this 
answer the question correctly twice, but this is a journey, as I explained, that was very difficult for me to un unveil or unravel. But at the end of the day, I think, as Akshay said, if there's bhavam, which results in purity, I guess, then you have great access to, to information that is, that is beyond you know, your understanding. I think God shows his grace in, in numerous ways to help you, you know, understand things better. Saira. Brother Arun. Okay, Sairam, brother. Um, I think you asked the significance of, you know, uh, of the rituals. The reality is uh, even uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, in, among the yajnas, yajnana, tapo, you know, japo yajnosi. He says, I am the yajna of japa. Even japam, you know, the repetition of the Lord's name is also yajna because we're offering that also to the Lord. So, uh, but, you know, sometimes we think uh, whether, whether it's a ritual, physical ritual going on, like the fire sacrifice where, you know, something's offered in the fire with chanting certain mantras. We think they are actually, they don't have, uh, sometimes there's a view that physically there is no benefit. I think at the physical level also there's immense benefit. Um, Swami says if a uh, farmer is planting seeds, people can say, why are they wasting the seeds on the soil, you know, which people should be eating. But the farmer knows when you plant, you know, you will get a large crop, which will feed multitudes. So the same way the rishis have devised these physical, they're scientists who have come up with the process. So they have significant at the physical, that level also. But then Swami wants us to translate it to other dimensions and ultimately offer our life also as a sacrifice. And so I think Swami is as Brother Vijay said, if Swami has given all the explanation we need in different Vahinis and if you read Satisai Vahini or you know, Prashnotra Vahini, uh, Sandehe Nivarani, um, mm -hmm. Gita Vahini, he has explained everything. If only we have the patience and the perseverance to sit down, read, study, contemplate, and discuss and understand. So I think, yes, there are multiple levels of meanings, as Brother Akshay also said. But, you know, it's a lifelong journey for us to understand the full significance of it. And Swami would say, when you understand the full significance, you have become one with me. <laughs> okay, so there's no end to that journey. But Swami has given us everything in simple terms, as Brother Vijay said. And I think all of us should read and we will find the answers to all of our questions there. Mm -hmm. Brother Vijay, this one is directed to you. 